With such a fantastic November, the question now is what's ahead? Are we looking at the good times continuing to roll or will it be the best of times now and the worst of times to come? So adding to the equation today, of course, we had a Fed day and with some awfully dovish comments from Fed Chief Powell, uh, that sent the markets, especially the small cap soaring. So is the soft landing now a mission accomplished? We're going to get to all of that and more. So welcome to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, alongside Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week. He is from O'Neill Global Advisors. He's a portfolio manager over there. How are you doing, Arusha? I'm I'm doing well. That was that was quite an introduction. There, <laughs> well, you know what? The producer's kind of helping out. He's uh, you know, shifting things a little bit around. I mean, we you you know how we go through producers, so it's yeah. always fun to you know and the, see 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 what happens with this one. Uh, I thought so we far, were starting Lord of the Rings there. <laughs> The epic conquest, right? Um, well, uh, certainly in order to help us make sense of this, uh, I think we've got kind of the best of the best that we can. Uh, it's it's Mark Minervini. He's returning to the show. Of course, Mark Minervini is a two-time investing champion, uh, U.S. investing champion, and uh, one of the show favorites, of course, uh, founder of the Minerv Minervini Private Access. Welcome back to the show, Mark. How you doing? It's great to be here, and with uh, all those questions you uh, opened up with, I better get out the crystal ball. Yes, right, exactly. Yeah, crystal ball, the answer those. Yeah. Well, and and you know, a lot of times I think that's what uh, sometimes people expect to have, like the the definite answer of what's going to happen in the future, but no one really knows. So a lot of times it's about being ready for anything, and that's uh, when we were talking, you know, in in the pre-show. That's really what you do, right, Mark? Yeah. So you know, with Right now, it's a balancing act. You know, we went from inflation. Uh, now it's softening, and the Fed is starting to soften the language. And now you're going to be hearing recession talk. You know, that's the mm -hmm. next thing that we'll be worrying about. Uh, and and you know, maybe that whether that's um, you know warranted or not. Uh, the bottom line is is to cut through all that noise. I look at the market and see what the market's doing, um, and that's usually a better. Uh, predictor and the verdict of the market is really all that matters. So that's how I cut through a lot of that noise. And, and that's my crystal ball. And it's been <laughs> much more accurate than uh, my, my opinion and my gut about economics and how they're going to affect the uh, the market. Yeah. So Mark, going off of that, what, what are your thoughts on the market right now? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we're definitely overbought. Everybody knows that. And when you stay persistently overbought for an extended period of time, especially when you come off of a correction or a bear market and you make that first rally up and you get this is a, just a classic what I call a lockout rally where everybody waits for a pullback and it doesn't come. Mm -hmm. uh, and the market just keeps marching and marching higher. And, and, and this time, very similar to uh, some of the other recoveries like 98 and, and uh, off the COVID lows, it's in a V fashion. It's coming straight up that right side. So that leaves a lot of people in the dust. Um, and then finally, you know, you, you get where they can't take it anymore. And the markets like today, we, we hit a new high and the uh, FANG as a group uh, hit new highs today. You hit an all time high in the Dow, uh, the SOX, the SMH, uh, all hitting uh, new highs. So now you're going to really start to uh, you know, suck in the last of the Mohegans here. and People are going to start chasing. Um, and that's usually at the, precisely at the wrong time. So when the market gets persistently overbought, it's a good sign longer term, but short term, it, it means that you need some type of digestion period. So from this point forward, if I saw strength, more strength in the market, I'd probably sell right into it. My stocks that are extended. Mm -hmm. So looking back to, you know, just last month, I mean, again, it was such a strong November, uh, started with the follow through day, November 1st. Uh, really strong rally back above 14,000 for the NASDAQ. And then just as we started getting to those July highs uh, around Thanksgiving, we, we took a little bit of a pause. Now, granted, it was only two weeks. Was that enough? Well, the good news is that, you know, you've had these pauses that are very uh, short term. I think, I think it was 2010 where we had a rally where you didn't get more than a 1% decline in the S&P for like, it was like 45 or 50 days. Um, yeah. And again, 2017 that, was another 2017 example of that. Was a, yeah, really good, you know, what I call an easy dollar environment where it just keeps marching higher and you don't get a whole lot of volatility. It's just a lot of alpha. So that's what you're seeing here. And that's great. You know, that, that's, that's exactly what you want to see. But, um, you know, I think at this point we are getting to the point where it may be too much of a good thing in the short term. And the question is, are those pullbacks enough? Uh, yeah, they are enough. They are enough. But here, here's the real key. And, and if you take a look at something like the NASDAQ, Arush and I talked about this uh, prior. Um, you got this big cup with handle forming. Mm -hmm. uh, you take a look, if you look at the monthly, you take a look at the uh, S&P 500 on a weekly. 
Uh, you've got this big base. I mean, if there's a party, you know, gonna gonna start here, uh, it or or if a party's getting going, it just started. Um, you know, we're we're just starting to emerge. Uh, I go back to April of uh, 1995, one of my biggest years. I, I was up over 400 percent that year, and the Dow had gone into new high ground months earlier, and I didn't start really getting invested and getting aggressive until April of 19 uh, of 1995, and that was way after the Dow. I'd gone into new high ground. So you don't necessarily have to uh, get in off the lows. Now, sometimes what happens is you get stocks that set up prior to the market emerging and, and moving up. Uh, about 1990 was a perfect example. A lot of stocks were Amgen and U.S. Surgical, Ballard Medical Products and all those. As a matter of fact, Costco, Wholesale, and Microsoft at the time were companies that very few people even heard of in 1990. They were all breaking out into new highs right off the lows in October. Um, and, but then there's other periods where you know you get the recovery and the market moves into new high ground and you don't get those setups until later on. Usually that happens in a V-shaped recovery. And mm -hmm. in '90 it was a more U-shaped recovery and it gave time. Well, when you come right off the lows, it doesn't give time for the stocks to, to digest those those previous declines. So that's what I think we have now. So we're probably going to get if we can hold up here and um, you know this isn't some type of uh, you know bear trap, which I, I it, so far things look pretty good. Um, I, I think the best setups are yet to come. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I pulled up the, the NASDAQ on the monthly chart and I, I, and we, yeah, we spoke about this earlier, but this is one of the most beautiful coupled handles that I think I've ever seen. I, I mean, it has everything going for it now. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work, but I think in, in many ways that is impressive. And, and I really puts in perspective that, like you said, Mark, we just may be getting started. Yeah, but here's the thing, though. When you take a look at some of these indexes that are forming these nice bases, the thing, the, the thing you have to realize is that right now, 42% of the S&P 500 market cap is in 20 names. Yeah. And it's very similar for the NASDAQ, too. So as we get these setups, they really represent a small number. And so well, now when you take a look at the IBD 50, it's just coming off the lows. You take a look at, you know, um, the, the IBD mutual fund index. And uh, this is pretty broad based um, with with, again, with managers that are putting, you know, big liquid names in there. You're going to have certainly the FANG stocks in in those funds, too. That 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 index is just coming off the lows. So this is what I'm saying. We're you know, we're really we're, we're very narrow right now and it hasn't broadened out yet. So if we truly are starting a new bull market here um, that has legs, again, the better, you know, the better times are, are yet to come. And so what about the small caps, right? The, the, the small caps are, are starting to, to move a little bit more. What do they need to do to, to get you more confident about yeah, so, the, the overall yeah, market? I'm very interested in small and mid caps. That's where I'm starting to gravitate now and, and get away from the mega caps. Um, and, you know, we've been, We've been buying some of those already. The, as an index, it's still just coming off the lows. The Russell uh, doesn't look that uh, it, that great. It's just coming off the lows. Uh, but there are a lot of names that are starting to participate. So I think it's time. If, if you take a look and you go back going into the COVID decline, um, the Russell is drastically underperforming. And then it had a period of outperformance uh, as we turned up there. It was, look, it was looking like small caps were going to come back after many after a decade or more of underperformance. Uh, and then we way underperformed during this last bear market. So now uh, I know there's a lot of managers. I remember uh, Dan Niles just was talking about how uh, small caps and he was interested in the Russell 2000 because it's been underperforming. I've been hearing this sort of underperformance argument, but we heard that for a decade. So yeah. instead, yeah, instead of trying to like, you know, guess when the underperformance is going to turn into outperformance, I just wait until it actually shows up. But the thing is, is before it shows up in the index, it's going to show up in individual stocks and the leading stocks are already going to take off. So you don't want to wait until you start seeing it in the Russell 2000. You want to be looking for those stocks now. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, this this kind of reminds me of in, in 2009, how we had had the great financial crisis, you know, great recession, all, all of this stuff that was going on. Stocks were decimated, you know, S&P 500 and NASDAQ both down 57 percent off their highs. And when when it came back up off the bottom and we got the follow through day in March, 
it really seemed like it took a while for growth to come come up. Uh, it was a lot of stuff coming off the bottom. Your city groups and your Fords that were Bank of America that were down in single digits. I think some of them had to do reverse splits in order to stay listed on the New York Stock Exchange because they had come down so much. That's um, right. it, it, so there, there was kind of this aspect of these things coming off the bottom um, and growth took a few months before it really you know, captured it. Do you think that's something that might be, you know, similar here or, or, or rotation that we're looking at? Yeah, I think so. And I'll tell you why. There's a couple of things. First of all, in, in 09, the 08 going into 09 was the most treacherous uh, periods ever. As a matter of fact, uh, I remember O'Neill uh, talking about that in a memo um, that, that that was one of the most treacherous environments that he had ever seen. Um, now we actually started to, you know, we, we have a cutoff as far as price is concerned. We, we don't usually look at stocks that are in the single digits, like, you know, $8, $6 stocks. At that time we were starting to think maybe we have to readjust because everything was low price. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the under 10 was where your big, uh, blue chips were <laughs> yeah. the under $10. <laughs> so the, the thing you had to realize and why I think this is similar be, you have to realize that when you get these big declines in stocks, you have a lot of overhead supply. So it takes time to work through that and for these stocks to rebuild and to come back. It's like a, an injury. You know, if you get a sprained ankle, you're back jumping around in a short period of time. But if you break your femur, it takes a lot longer. Same thing with stocks. When you get these big breaks, and those of you who know my 50-80 rule states that in a, when a secular leader tops, 50% of them will go down 80%, 80% of them will go down 50 percent well this time boy it should have been the 80 90 rule you know it was mm -hmm. uh i mean we had stocks you know, paypal and, and names yeah. like you know big mega caps that were down 70 80 percent uh 90 percent 95 percent some of these so that's a tremendous amount of supply so just like in 08 09 it takes time for that to repair rebuild and when we've got in this particular cycle, we've got a combination of that and this this mega cap dominance. So with the two, that really sort of masks it. And that's what I'm saying. You really got to look beneath the surface and look for those uh, those select performers and really just disengage from the indexes, disengage from the economic information and the and the uh, the indexes and tune in to the individual stocks. And don't have a bias, whether it's small cap, mid cap, large cap, you know, look for the stocks that meet the criteria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, maybe talk a little bit about always being prepared for the other side of the trade, right? Because everything's got starting to look a little bit more bullish now. Things are starting to participate more. But you always have to have in the back of your mind and always be prepared that, hey, this still might not work out. Yeah, I have basically like there's a couple always uh, scenarios. One is always trade with a stop loss. Always know where you're getting out before you get in, where you're going to you know, cut and run if this trade doesn't work out. The other one is always look to improve your worst case scenario. So as this trade starts to work, you start off with, say, an 8% stop, and now maybe the stock's up 10, 12, 15%. Well, now you want to create asymmetric leverage and start improving that stop, maybe move it up to break even now. Now you've got a worst case scenario of break even and a profit. So you've now created much, you've created asymmetric leverage, right? So those, that's a sort of start, start with one uh, uh, scenario, move up to that next scenario. Um, and then the next scenario is always be prepared for the opposite side of the trade. So now, uh, I, now I've gotten myself invested. Trades have worked. I'm up on a bunch of names. All right, now it's like on the crap table. You know, when you put all those bets out there, you say, press the, press this one, add to that one, give me a hard way. And now you've got all these bets on the table, one seven, and you'll lose them all. So as right. you ratchet up your portfolio and you're adding positions, adding, and you're getting more and more invested, now you're fully invested. Now the market corrects and you take that hit across the board. And that's where you get that equity drawdown. So be prepared, you know, when you're, when you're long and you're heavily long, be prepared to move and run and get the other guys. Um, I can't remember if it was O'Neill, if it was Jesse Livermore, or whoever said it, uh, that there's in the stock market, there's the quick and there's the dead, yeah. you know, right. Bill had that in how to make money in stocks, right? It, it's yeah. so true. <laughs> you know, you've got to, especially when, you know, you got stocks that are extended and they've run up a lot and they're, they're prone to a pullback. They can pull back very sharply, 
you know, one minute you're up and the next minute, you know, you've got a big gaping hole in your equity curve and you got all this volatility. So I sell at the strength. You know, I don't wait for them to weaken. I'm usually selling right at the strength and getting out when the getting's good. And then, of course, when you have a liquidity issue, if you if you have the, you know, the problem of having a, enough money where you, you you need the liquidity, you know, that's sort of what you by default end up gravitating to. Mm -hmm. And and maybe talk a little bit more about uh, again this this idea of patience because you've been really saying that with all of your uh, appearances this year uh, mm -hmm. that you know there were a lot of rallies that. Um, or even in, in 2022, there were a lot of rallies that looked so strong coming off the bottom. And this, this whole idea of patience for waiting for that fat pitch, um, you know, the right time. Um, is there anything in terms of like what, what really clues you in? You know, because again, we have seen setups. We have seen stocks breaking out. Uh, and we have finally started getting traction um, on, on some of them. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned, some of them moved so quickly by the time you kind of started getting in that motion, uh, it, it was, it was a little bit too late. So what's, yeah. what's the next level of patience here to use? The key, the key you just said is traction. You know, that's mm -hmm. the real thing. Like you could, the index is going to be taking off and, and stocks are setting up. You've got, you've got basically everything looks great. You got a bunch of setups, stocks are breaking out, but how does that translate into, are you actually getting profits and is the volatility, um, you know, low enough or, or is there too much volatility where it's whipping you out of the trades? What's the, you know, the environment like? It's almost like when you play poker, like what's the texture of the game? You know, you can get a game that has the right elements. Maybe there's, you know, the right players on there and you, you assess the game, but the texture of the game is just not conducive, you know, to the type of play that you, you know, you want to play, whether it's, you know, a lot of volatility, a lot of stock, stack variation. You know, I, I always equate it to, poker and games like that where, you know, we're assessing odds and then placing bets. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, what I'm doing is gauging the most important thing. How are my trades working? Because it really yeah. doesn't matter what happens with the Dow. It doesn't matter what happens with your friend's account and, your, and, and the mutual fund and this index. What's happening in your own trading? And I, I think the best advice that I could give to people is that, it, you, you, you use your own account sort of like the train and you're the caboose. And until you start getting traction with your own trading, you don't step it up. And, and, and with that, you, you very rarely get into much trouble. But what happens is, you know, we're looking at the Dow. It's hitting new highs now. And then you say, I should be invested. I'm behind the curve here. And you start chasing and you start breaking rules. And you're not even getting that traction. You don't have any, it's what we call earning the right to play larger. This is something we, we, we say all, very often to our members and people who come to our, our workshops. You have to earn the right to play large. It, this, as, as a matter of fact, this is something Stanley Druckenmiller, um, at one time I was an advisor to the Soros Group, and um, you know, I, I, the progressive exposure actually came you know, from uh, George Soros. There's a video I've shared on Twitter a couple times where he talks about progressive exposure. Never really, and this is coming from, you know, someone who's managing billions of dollars is still using this uh, uh, this philosophy of making sure that your investments, your, your smaller positions are doing well before you ramp up to larger positions and larger exposure. I mean, why why would you throw you know, good money after bad if, if the trades aren't working? Just because, you know, the Dow's hitting new highs? Well, that doesn't mean anything. Like right now, if you look at the, like I said, look at the IBD 50 and look at the Dow. There's a very different picture there. And the IBD 50 more represents the type of stocks that I would be trading or, mm -hmm. or, or, or someone like Arusha would be trading, you, Justin, than, than the Dow. So, mm -hmm. you know, what, and, and my trading is probably going to more reflect, you know, that index, but it could even not even reflect that index. You know, you might have all the indexes taking off because also your trading also um, represents your own idiosyncrasies, your own foibles, your own style, your own, you know, just because you have a strategy doesn't mean you follow it religiously and, and you have the discipline. Mm -hmm. So it's really a net net of, of everything. And that's, you know, what I let guide me. That's, mm -hmm. that's like one of the secrets to my success is all that patience is built upon, you know, just the traction in my own or lack of in my own trading, letting my own results, uh, you know, guide me. 
Yeah. I mean, it's, it's really using the feedback of the market to make your yes. decisions. I mean, you know, it's, you're either wrong or you're right. And the market will tell you you're either making money or you're not. It's just that simple. So, uh, yeah. well, let's take a break right here. And when we come back, we're going to get a little bit more into these, uh, secrets of Mark Minervini success. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Trading Apple. Sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leverage and inverse ETFs from Direction. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with my special guest every week, Arusha Paris from O'Neill Global Advisors. And our even more specialer guest is uh, Mark Minervini this week. Uh, he, of course, is a two-time U.S. investing champion founder of the Minervini Private Access and, uh, you know, just a wealth of knowledge. I should also mention author because some of your books uh, are just really, really fantastic in terms of not not just the trading methodology, but really the mindset uh, behind trading. So in that vein, Mark, let's talk a little bit about this kind of mindset idea and right now the sentiment of the market and how we should be uh, making sense of, of where we're at right now. Well, if you talk about sentiment in the traditional sense of, you know, like sentiment surveys and using it as a contrarian, you know, indicator, um, you look at some of the, like Holbert Financial Digest and the Investors Intelligence, we're starting to get to those sort of yellow flag levels. Not, I wouldn't say the red flag levels, but if the market keeps hitting the highs here, you'll probably get to those fairly certain because we are getting some somewhat lofty there. So that usually leads to a pullback and with the market being overbought, certainly you know, we're going to get a pullback. I, we do. We are going into a seasonally bullish uh, period, too. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the cycle work, the presidential cycles, all those cycles um, going into December is a bullish period. So I think pullbacks are still going to be somewhat limited. Um, and I would say, you know, pullbacks are probably viable here. Uh, but certainly the sentiment is starting to get frothy. But now if you look at the longer term sentiment, and I look at sentiment in three ways. One, short term. Two, long term. Three, what, what people are saying and what people are doing. So what they're saying is the sentiment surveys, what they're doing are things like put call ratios, things like that. Um, when, when you look at sort of uh, the longer term sentiment, I look at things like IPOs issued, secondaries, um, uh, you know, the margin debt. Those are just in the very beginning of turning up. And that's good. When they first start turning up off of a bear market, that's bullish. You want to see increased sentiment. But they haven't gotten to extreme levels. So we're in the long term, we're nowhere near extreme contrary sentiment but in the short term we're starting to get there so I, again as we get stronger here if the market were the run-up from here i'd say it'd probably be a good time to you know to use that strength to sell your your stocks that are ahead of themselves one more kind of sentiment indicator that a lot of folks use is the vix um and i mean the vix down here at like four-year lows, uh, if you look at the CBOE volatility index, uh, a lot of times people look at that as, you know, complacency. Um, you know, what is this something that you use as well? Well, if it stays there for a long period of time, but when the VIX gets above 28, you get to the 30 level, that's what we call a bear market warning. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of times in, in it'll the market will bottom intermediate or short term at that level. So it'll appear to be sort of like a contrary indicator, but also when you go into a trending market, um, it'll it'll hit that level and you'll get that volatility. So volatility is not our friend, not, well, at least not the way I trade, um, mm -hmm. but volatility, you know, causes causes a lot of aggravation and a lot of, you got to take Rolaids and drink Pepto-Bismol. You know, <laughs> I, I often say I came into the stock market to make money, not get an ulcer. So, <laughs> yeah, <seriously. laughs> so the low volatility, when you get down there with the low volatility, that's great because that's what we want to see and that's a, a rising market but if it stays there persistent for a long period of time this happened just not long ago before we got this last correction we were we were, we were down uh um for a while at low volatility and usually what will happen is the volatility will double and then it's almost exactly what happened we were around 13 12 to 13 on the vix and then we went up to uh i think it was 26 or so 24 or 26 so it just about doubled and that's where we got this most recent bottom so, uh, you know, the VIX doesn't have a particular level, too. So it's kind of hard. You know, sometimes the market will bottom at 60. Sometimes it's at 30. Um, you know, sometimes it'll stay low for months and months and months. And sometimes it's, it's, it's quick. So you really can't gather anything except from the VIX of whether volatility is high or low. 
I like low volatility. And so now when you get that persistent low volatility and you get a lot of alpha in the market, now when you get that, that, that short-term spike in the VIX, that's usually a buying opportunity and a pullback in the market, a short-term pullback in the market. So that's what you would look for now on a pullback, maybe a 3 5% pullback in the S&P. You get that VIX to turn up, and that's where you start to look to, uh, uh, you know, to, to step up. Uh, to yeah. play here. And, and to be clear, just so people understand, you know, of course, the VIX, you know, a lot of people call it the fear index. When we talk about volatility here, it's, it's really implied volatility uh, right. because it's going off the options market and it's looking forward uh, as opposed to historical volatility when you're looking you know, backwards. Um, but yeah, go ahead, Arusha. Did you have a something you were going to? Yeah. Now you have a lot of followers on X. What What about sentiment there? Did you Do you notice a change in in kind of the the tweets that are going out? So we're we're we are officially calling Twitter X. Oh uh, yeah, I, I was about to say Twitter. <laughs> but, well, but well, you I, know, I, I, I use myself. X, formally known as Twitter, kind of like yeah, you know the Prince, like you know uh -huh. the Prince change. I, you uh, threw so. me for a second there. I, was yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> I threw myself. Yeah, he's like, I'm not on X. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. So I'm sorry. <laughs> so you said, I, yeah. What about it on Twitter? Well, just the sentiment there. Do you notice any change in the tones of the tweets that that you're applying to, or just even seeing uh, on yeah. social media? I do my own survey every now and then. I'll say, you know, what's the next? What do you think the next ten percent is, upside to downside? Uh, whether you know we're going up or down from here. And recently, and and I find I, mean, I must have a pretty uh, skillful following because they're usually right in the short term. Uh, yeah. But if they persist, I, I also notice when I get near 70 percent of, of the when they do the polls and usually my poll will get 6,000, 10,000 responses. So it's pretty, you know, pretty significant. Uh, you start getting around 70 percent. Then you start looking the opposite direction. It is a good contrary. But they're usually right in the beginning. And just not long ago, a couple of weeks ago, it was a lot of bullishness. And sure enough, we went in that direction. But now I think as we're persisting here. Um, yeah, you're, you're, you will definitely see that show up. The sentiment is like a, it's like a, a flock of birds. You know, they, they, they all move together. You know, you yeah. maybe, maybe you know, there's a lead, you know, there's a lead group, but the whole flock really tends to gravitate around with, with each other and move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alter, alter and and, and just, just for folks that uh, aren't aware, uh, if you do want to participate in some of those polls that uh, Mark puts out on Twitter, uh, or X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, you can absolutely follow him at Mark Minervini. Uh, that's, that's his handle there. So, uh, yeah, and, and you, you post a lot of great stuff, historical precedent, um, you know, just kind of uh, overall lessons. You often will throw quotes from uh, great traders uh, from your own book, uh, a lot, a lot of wisdom there, so definitely worth uh, a follow. Every um, now and then I rant and rave, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I do. I post you know, pretty much every day since 2010. I made a commitment to, to post regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's 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 definitely a lot of uh, a, a lot of good stuff there. Um, so also also kind of on this, uh, uh, are, are you on any other social media? Uh, just out of curiosity. No, I'm just on for my own family and friends. I have on Facebook, but I don't have a public, any public. Uh, mm -hmm. Twitter's my public uh, site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, very, 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 very good stuff there. Now let's let's talk a little bit um, about, you know, when when you've kind of got this idea of sentiment, you know, how does this d does this affect how you trade um or is i mean it's certainly what the, what's happening with the stocks but again when you're seeing a lot of your stocks doing so well you're seeing the sentiment get a little frothy it's it's been there for a while um you know you mentioned earlier how you like to sell into strength so what are kind of your rules that you employ in order to kind of uh take some of the take some of those chips off the table before that seven comes rolling yeah Sentiment really only affects like my actual trading when it's really super excessive and the technicals are agreeing with it. Like, for instance, if I've got a lot of stocks that are really extended, and things are just going great for a long period of time um, and sentiment is you know, really lofty for an extended period of time, then you know, I'll, I'll take it into consideration. It might actually affect you know, my decisions on the stocks, but it, generally it doesn't. It just gives, sort of giving me an idea of, um, you know, where we are in the bigger picture. Uh, I really, 95% of everything I do is just the stocks. This is, this is a key, this was a, a key change in my career. 
when I first started, I started as a quant. I, I, I ran models and, and um, formed an opinion on the market based on my quant models. And then once I was bullish on the market, I then looked at the groups and looked for the best groups. I did group relative strength work, look for the best groups. And then from there, when I found the best groups, I looked for the, best, the leading stocks in those groups. What ended up happening was the top down uh, approach. What a lot of people top down right? approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was missing the leaders every single time. I was never in the leading stocks. So I, and th this is how it happened. I would, I would find some stocks that were setting up, but then I would notice, wait a minute, there were, there's these, you know, three or four names that have already doubled and they set up perfectly three months ago. They set up perfectly six months ago. Mm -hmm. um, why didn't I see those? Well, because I was fixated on the market and leaders lead. So they were setting up and in many cases taking off before the market even bottomed in a bear market or just as the market turned up and sentiment hadn't turned and the trend indicators and all these things that I was watching uh, that were lagging or coincident. So I flipped the whole thing around. I said, I'm going to do just the opposite and experiment stocks, group, market. So meaning, OK, if I see a couple stops, stocks taking off, well, then I'm going to look at that group and see that and see if there's if that's a, a group that they're leading in. And then from there, as the groups start working and stocks start working, that means that the market's pretty good. And I'll start looking for the, you know, the signs of the market's bottoming. And then everything changed. 1980, it was about 1989. Um, I started flipping that around and I start latching on to some really good winners. LA Gear was one, it went up 400% in like a year. Mm -hmm. Then 1990 came and I was really prepared with that bottoms up approach. And I, I, I found Amgen, and US Surgical and all these stocks that O'Neill was in and David Ryan was in. We we're all buying the same names back then. They had big earnings and were coming out of bases and holding up really well in the bear market and going into new high ground. Some of them even before the Dow had, or, the, or the, you know, the Dow and the Nasdaq had made their bear market low um, in October. They were breaking out to new highs. And the Dow didn't really take off. It still went through a, a, a troughing period. Didn't take off until we went to war in Iraq on January. I think it was January 15th. Is it the 4th or 5th or the 15th? I think it was January 15th. And then the market blasted off. Um, and then everything started breaking out, a couple of candles and these, these big bases. But prior to that, all the leaders were already gone. I mean, all, all the, real, uh, the real leading stocks that were the, 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 the rip-roaring leaders of that cycle um, now that cycle lasted for a while, so you had many chances. So I, I want to make sure everybody understands that when you get a bull market, you know you may miss the first few, you know, the first handful of names in the first month or two off the lows. However, two things: one, it doesn't mean that there's not going to be other stocks that set up. It's not, it's not just a small little group. You could have waves and waves and waves and many new stocks that come public and come to market or or, or set up. Uh, and go into new uptrends months and sometimes even years after the bear market. And also, those initial stocks that maybe break out off the lows usually give you another one, two, three basis to trade off of. So even, even though you may be paying higher for them, it doesn't matter as long as they go higher from there. So, you know, Yahoo, I traded off the IPO, then I traded off another base and another base and another base. I traded it like five times over a period of, 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 a, of a couple of years. Um, and many of those names. So again, a stock that's breaking out, you know, broke out maybe a couple months ago and you missed, keep an, keep an eye on it. If it's got all the criteria, you get another base, you trade off of that next setup. And sometimes those are the better setups. They actually, the momentum's there and they start moving even faster. Yeah, so Mark, I, I guess like maybe in the beginning, early part of your career, you would have a tendency to hold stocks a little bit longer, right? Kind of more yeah. of the traditional O'Neill style, but you adapted right over the last 10 plus 20 years or so. You may, maybe talk about that a little bit and how, how you adapted and how maybe your trading style changed. When we first started, we had no choice because you really had to hold. It was just by, by default. First of all, the commit, I had a very small amount of money, so I had to make big gains because the commissions were, when I, my first trade, the commission was like uh, $207 for the trade. And even after that, for years, it was like there were $150, $170 per, per side. So you could do the math. Um, and, and it was almost you know fruitless to trade if you didn't have a lot of money. And then the spreads were, were very wide, and uh, especially on NASDAQ names. I remember buying stocks that were 19, uh, 16 bid, 19 offered. You know, oh, 10, bit, 10 bit, 15 <laughs> offer. 
you know, 50 percent spread. He's <laughs> crazy, crazy spread. Uh, yeah. So so like you, you you really you had to buy when the bid was moving. You had to hold and go for. So we like a short term trade when I first started was a double. Like we were looking for 100 percent. We were looking for 10 baggers. Like that was like the, what, what I would say would equate to a double today. Back wow. then was a wow. 10 bagger. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, it was a 10 bagger. You wanted to go up tenfold. You're looking for stocks that are up four, five hundred percent, a thousand percent. You know, a double was kind of like first base. Then the SOS bandits. Well, first of all, commissions came down. Uh, Ernie Oldie was one of the one of the first to have discount commissions, sixty dollars a trade. We were like jumping up and down like that was just this, you know, discount, deep discount. That allowed us to trade a little more, and the commission wasn't as much of a factor now to do to have turnover. Um, spreads narrowed. Eventually, you know, they they uh, had they had the 1997. They had the uh, um, the uh, order handling rule change, and that narrowed spreads and so forth. Uh, but but again, the whole the internet trading was the big change because you had to call your broker. You picked up the phone. As a matter of fact, he might in fast markets they didn't pick up the phone. Uh, mm-hmm. You'd be in a stock that's falling, and you want to get out and oh stop out. You call and just rings and rings and rings, and yeah, and. Literally, like in 87, people were going into the brokerage firms and shooting their brokers. Like, you know, people, yeah, and, um, like, because they wouldn't answer the phones. And uh, it was it was a mess um, but in the 87 crash. So so then when you had Internet trading, now you got the commissions came down, the spreads narrowed and you had that quick action where you can move very fast. Mm-hmm. Everything changed. The whole game changed. And that's where short term trading started coming in. We were more swing trading, you know, than um, the gains of like 25, 30, 40, 50 percent were like sort of first base. Now, I mean, I trade, I trade, you know, 5 percent, 10, 12 percent moves, you know, when I'm in the short term trading mode, when there's nothing else, you know, when the market's not very good on the swing or the longer term. So it's it's just compressed. Things have just compressed. The time frame has just gotten shorter and things have gotten faster. Nothing's changed except it just is faster. Okay. Yeah. And we should mention that, you know, the the benefit of compounding is if you have a lot of those short term trades, 10, 12 percent, 20 percent here and there, uh, that can really compound out to a phenomenal year. When you won the U.S. investing championship last, um, you know, you had what was it, 200, uh, 200 some odd percent? Um, it was 300 and stuff. 300 yeah, 300 percent for the year, and you know a lot of that was short-term trades that you just all of it was. Yeah, uh, because there was happened. no long-term trade. Right. Yeah, nothing was working. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so well. So as you said, you know, if you have the turnover and you can turn the edge over, you certainly can amass you know big returns. Um, I you know, I've been trading the markets now for 40 years, um, hundreds of thousands of percent in profits and. It's almost all from short term, uh, short to intermediate term trading, not mm-hmm. day trade. I don't generally day trade, although now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely the shortest term I've ever traded just simply, you know, out by default. But um, yeah, just in the very beginning, I was long term. if you would. Yeah. Well, uh, on the sentiment side, let's talk a little bit about time frames, because in, in some ways you, you've shown this market action of. Uh, this this long term trend that we could just be starting. So again, you've got that in your mind. But on the flip side, you know, short term, you think that we could be in a pullback. So how do you kind of hold both of those bullish and bearish feelings in your mind at one time? I just I just trade the stocks. You know? So it <laughs> <laughs> I try. I mean, I can have whatever I have in my mind, but I just ignore it. So I, I mean, mm-hmm. I, I have there. We have seven thousand thoughts a day. So. There's lots of thoughts going through your mind, but we, <laughs> but we don't let those 7,000 thoughts guide us or we'd be doing 7,000 different things. You right. know, so again, you know, with the market, I have lots of thoughts, thoughts and lots of opinions, but I divorce myself from that. And that's why I have rules and I have a strategy. And when the stocks, I'll give you a perfect example, you know, COVID, um, you know, Mark, you guys know Mark Ritchie, of course, he, he works mm-hmm. for me now. He's a you know, phenomenal uh, young still a relatively young trader, um, incredible results uh, over the years. Uh, came to my first master trader program with him and Brandon Hedgepath, who, who trade as a team, and they both work for me now. They came to the first master trader program in 2010, uh, started with a very small amount of money and turned it into, they managed 20, $25 million of their own money. Um, he, uh, you know, at the time, he's you know, working for me, and uh, we get the COVID decline. And after that, around April uh, of that 
year coming off the lows, stock started to set up according to our criteria. He mm-hmm. calls me up and he says, you know, what do we do here? I mean, there's stock setups, but we're not buying them, are we? I mean, it's like the end of the world. I said, we buy them. You know, at we if they're setting up, we buy them. And we set our stops. And if we get knocked out, we get knocked out. But we're buying the setups. We're we're not gonna we're not gonna have an opinion here. And because we're scared, you know, that's that matter of fact, the best conditions that I've seen in the market after 40 years of doing this is when everything's negative, you're terrified, and there's lots of stock setups. When I'm scared to death and there's blood in the streets, but there's stock setups, that's the key. When yeah. I'm not buying when they're down and trying to bottom fish. When there's stock set up, stocks coming out of bases, coming out of my signature BCP, when we see a lot of those stock setups, just believe the stocks. They're, they're right a lot more than, than your opinion. So we bought them, and it turned out to be a great – matter of fact, that was the year that Mark Ritchie, I think he was up, he was up 350 or 360 percent that year. So he had, he had a great year. Um, and, you know, that's when DocuSign and all these, you know – and, and here's a perfect example of stocks really having the final say and where one door, you know, that closes or, or you know, you opens another door. So it was a disaster, right? COVID was a disaster for a, a part of the economy. It was also a gigantic boom for another part of the economy. Yeah. Zoom, DocuSign, the online, the stay at home, Teladoc. All those stocks blasted off, and there was a bull market. So, as Kramer says, there's always a bull market somewhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> there, it, you know, that's that's actually true. There, there really is always a bull market somewhere. Uh, maybe you know, there are periods of time where all assets go down in a, in a severe bear market, but money has to find a home, and it rotates around, um, and and every door opens up another door, and and sure enough, that led to some really great opportunities, and and many of those were short lived, but huge you know gains in a very short period of time yeah exactly. yeah and if you don't take those gains <laughs> they've all round tripped or even gone a lot lower than absolutely yeah you, know. you got to remember that the leading stocks you know turn into some of the best you know shorts <laughs> later yeah. on and because most companies can't sustain the, that type of growth for you know and and the the market goes to extreme so you do you do have to lock them down i know we have these examples of amazon well if you held amazon you would have made 80,000 you know made 100,000% but would you really have held you know would you really have gone through a 90% decline would you not well how about you know okay so you would sell at 100,000% but you wouldn't have sold at 10,000% or how yeah. about a thousand percent? You know, yeah. I, most people they would have sold when they're up six points. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's like nowadays. So you know, it, it's unrealistic. It's completely you know ridiculous to say you know you know hold for a hundred thousand percent move. I, I'm sure there's somebody out there who did it, but yeah. but not many. Um, yeah. Yeah. And to your point earlier, you know that fifty eighty rule comes into play a lot of times. So. Uh, not something that most people can sit through very well. And who wants to lose 80% of their money? I mean, that's, that's no yeah, fun. The real thing <laughs> that, that the real thing that I have learned over the years, over the decades of trading is that it's simply unnecessary. You know, I can make my return. I can make the return that I want to make um, without the volatility, without going through those big declines, um, without being invested all the time and fully invested and being exposed to risk. I can still make those returns and trade, swing trade, shorter term trade, um, and be in and out of the market at opportune times. I, I just it has, hasn't been necessary for me to take that type of risk and go through those big declines. And Bill O'Neill would would concur. You know, uh, this is where I learned a lot of this from was from Bill. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the stocks, how you can handle them, and what we can learn from some of these past trades. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Trading Tesla. Sometimes you get the bear. Sometimes it gets you. Single stock daily leveraged and inverse ETFs from Directions. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's objectives, risk, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus at Direction.com. Read carefully. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with Arusha Pierce, who joins me every week. He's a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And of course, on the show this week, we've got Mark Minervini returning to the show, two-time investing champion, 
author of numerous books on trading and investing and actually championship mindset, uh, and of course, founder of the Minervini Private Access. So uh, we're going to kind of go a little bit rapid fire because there were so many stocks uh, to talk about and so little time. So uh, let's let's go ahead and start with Lennar. Uh, housing stocks, probably one of those examples of, okay, everyone's talking about how bad the housing uh, market is and you know commercial real estate, but real estate has been one of the the big leaders of the of the year and certainly from the bottom. Uh, how how are you handling Lennar? Uh, well, we have a position in Lennar and DHI, but now uh, reducing it into strength here, so um, getting getting a little bit ahead of itself short term, and that's a lot of names now. That's what's happening We're, as we've run up in the market. We're getting some stocks now that are that are starting to get a little bit frothy in the short term, um, but again, not as much of my trading is the the uh, swing trading. So yeah. once the stocks start having the risk outweighing the reward, uh, usually I either cut back or or sell altogether. So th those those would be uh, some names that you know we'd be looking to sell into strength. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier I should have uh, uh, you know made you define it, but you mentioned the VCP, which of course is the volatility contraction pattern. Um, mm -hmm. So based on is that what you were using to get into this stock? Um, virtually every stock that I ever trade has some type of volatility contraction. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so we're you know buying these names uh, coming out around uh, December first. Right. Uh, yeah, after they ran up that right side, and uh, and then. Basically, that's a classic cup of handle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and and one thing. But when you took here... a look at it, it looks like I mean, it's just breaking out. So this this certainly could be the beginning of a bigger move. Uh, right. We're talking just short term, and, you're, and we're heading into earnings too on many of these names. Too. So you could get all really around the earnings. Yeah. So tomorrow it looks like that they're going to report. Yeah, and then the the home builders are really strange because they don't all report together. They all seem like they give each other like two weeks apart mm -hmm. so you think you're done with the home builders and all of a sudden here's one are now reporting the straggler but, uh, <laughs> yeah exactly it's really funny but um yeah so so 11 percent from the from the pivot right now lightening up into it and of course earnings mm -hmm. yeah. now uh another area of strength recently has been travel um i mean expedia booking yeah. uh m1 mmyt something that maybe not a lot of people know about uh but this is in the travel booking space for india so uh, maybe talk a little bit about this one since it's not on everyone's radar. Yeah, well, real quick, I mean, booking is one that uh, we, we, we currently have as an open position uh, mm -hmm. long. Okay. Again, another one that we, we're at a profit, you know, we're buying it around the same time, somewhere in that neighborhood of uh, December 1st, uh, along with some of these other names that broke out. Again, a classic couple of handle DCP characteristics. Um, the MMYT is another one, you know, in the, in the group, as you pointed out, it's an Indian-based uh, a travel um, came out just about a week or so ago. Uh, broke out. I think we we bought that on twelve four. That's really just very classic. Um, another smaller, you know, cup of the handle, and it's got that nice tight uh, VCP characteristics on the on the right. You know, these are just classic setups, and this is where there's times. And this is another thing. Go back to O'Neill, his book. There's a, I forget what page it's on. This is a loud warning to the wise, and it's yeah. All of you know that, of course, and it's it's boxed off and it basically says that, you know, these things are not in a bear market. These techniques are not going to work. It doesn't mean they don't work. It means that you have to know when to apply them. So that's part of we were talking about that traction. Part of that traction is to apply it when it make when it's logical that it should be working. Right. You get a follow through day. Market's turning into an uptrend. Uh, you're getting that traction. Now, these these chart patterns should break out and start to work. And that's where you, you need to wait until that's happening. Once that's happening, then you can start pressing your bets. And, and that's what we've seen now. So, um, you know, the, these are just, many of these are just fresh breakouts. And, and if you're a short-term trader, yeah, you're taking some profits and you're, you're trading that, that first move up. But uh, if you're longer term, this is just the beginning in many of these stocks probably, likely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's worth mentioning because, again, we noted that the follow-through day happened on November 1st, but these stocks that we just covered, they were breaking out December 1st, you know, so a full month afterwards. And after yeah. that kind of little break that we talked about after or around Thanksgiving, so there were those fresh opportunities coming out with those volatility contraction patterns. After a follow through day, particularly after a correction or a bear market, you, usually the first 
three months, several a couple months is your period where you'll get a lot of leading stocks will take off. It's not right off of the follow through day. Um, sometimes you'll get stocks that'll take off right on the day of the follow through day. They'll break out of the basis on that day. I usually will buy at least some of those names. Um, that's that's a bill rule too, where uh, you know if, if you get a follow through day and you have setups, um, you should buy something and maybe 25% invested, but put your toe in the water at that point. Uh, but but again, you take a look at something like MMYT, which is make my trip, of course. Uh, look, the earnings are huge. They got huge earnings, big sales, uh, great estimates going forward. Uh, yeah, it's really got hitting on all the cylinders. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work. You still want to use a stop loss if it, if it if it turns tail on you. But that that that's about you know as good as it gets as far as getting all the classic uh, criteria. Certainly the canceling criteria. Yeah, and speaking of long term with MMYT, what's kind of interesting about it? It's emerging out of a over a 10 year base. Yes. Which is pretty, pretty interesting. So I um, love, I love when we're hitting an all time high, a fresh all time high. Um, and I look at the estimates and I get what I, what I look for, what I call a breakout year where you see that moving forward, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when you, you're moving forward, you see, if you go back and you look at the annual earnings and they're in a channel, maybe for four or five, six years. And now you look and you see the most recent year or the next estimate of the next year is yeah. breaking out of that range and you're moving it to new high ground. Yeah, that that's uh, that's precisely what I'm looking for. So I, and, I, and then exactly finally, right. uh, one thing about Indian stocks, I, I don't know if you had a chance to look at like individual Indian stocks in the Indian stock market. They are through the roof. It is Absolutely. unbelievable. And in many ways, they actually trade uh, more can slim than the U.S. market. Yeah. Because a lot less algos goes. And like 100 percent. I, I, we have, I have a, a, a someone who came to our workshop uh, in 2017 that uh, started with a thousand dollars and turned it into twenty five million dollars in the Indian market. Wow. From two, yes. And that matter of fact, flew. I. I not going to uh, uh, share it, uh, respect out of his privacy, uh, but he flew to the U.S. just a, a month or so ago um, and took me out to took me out to lunch and flew all the way from India just to have lunch with me. And I certainly wasn't going to say no to that. With um, <laughs> amazing results and showed me showed me everything, showed me his accounts and the, the trades. It was really just uh, something else. But I could tell you this. Um, these markets, these these markets around the world, some of them you have a much better opportunity because they're they're not as efficiently priced. Um, but the, the the issue with that is that, and this is what we were talking about. He he flew here and he said to me, "How do we go to the next level?" Because he's hitting a liquidity issue now. So and now in the U.S., of course, twenty five million is not a lot of money to put in the market. Uh, but in the Indian market. And some of these other markets, you go like the Chilean market or something, they, there's like 100 stocks that make up the market. And yeah. these stocks will move sometimes 100 percent, 50 percent in a day or two. So you get this tremendous upside, but you might only be able to buy 100 or 1,000 shares. So, so that's the, you know, that's the challenge is the, is the liquidity. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. There's great opportunities uh, in other markets, too. So uh, let's turn our attention. Uh, leisure is certainly one of the things that we've been looking at a little bit. And. In the toy space, though, this is a little bit different in leisure. So let's take a look at Jack's uh, ticker symbol J A K K. Yeah, I, I mean, this is a stock. You know, out, out of all the names that you know we're, we're talking about, many of them I've already purchased uh, probably weeks ago or even months ago. Um, so we got a lot of stocks that are up now, and I'm actually looking to sell many of them into strength. Uh, this is one that's just starting to emerge and. Uh, uh, just recently, over the last few days, we just put this on our focus list just a couple of days ago. And today, it had a nice after pulling back for two days, back to the breakout. Um, it's uh, it, it's now moved right back into high ground. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is acting really great. One of the things you might look at this and think this is extended, but this mm -hmm. is what is referred to as a power play. I call it a power play. O'Neill used to call them high tight flags, um, where stock doubles uh, in eight weeks or less and then moves sideways, uh, generally for uh, a couple of weeks or so. And then when it comes out of there, it, it will be extended uh, on a longer term basis. Uh, but that's where the reason why it's so powerful is because after it makes such a big move in such a small period of time, it doesn't correct very much. And there's not much profit taking. And that means there's not much supply there. And that's a that's a sign of strength. So we usually try to play that for a continuation. And mm -hmm. some of the biggest, biggest winners or the fastest velocity moves come out of these power plays. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, also, if you start seeing a number of power play setups, that's just telling you something else about the market, right? Absolutely. 95 was a perfect example. I said that was one of my big years. Um, and that was, I, I termed that at the time, the year of the power play. There was just one after the next, after the next, so many power plays that year. And no wonder I had a big year because that was the year where we had a lot of velocity movement, um, you know, com coming from these, uh, from these uh, setups. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so now, the, to the toy space too, you know, I just found out, I went over a friend of mine's house and his son was making this big elaborate Lego uh, airplane. And, but I just realized another one of my friends called me, he's in the military and this military guy who's a captain in the military called me up. And he's like, Oh yeah, I just went and bought Legos and I play with Legos now. I'm like, what? <laughs> and, but grown people are Legos are like a thing right now. Um, yeah. With even adults. Yeah. Uh -huh. Legos. I don't, you know, not that I'm not, putting these two together but yeah i just with toys i just something that i just learned about legos but what's yeah, interesting is like yeah. hasbro just announced that they're laying off people mattel's like hitting new lows mm -hmm. so it is kind of interesting you're seeing jacks right here i know they do probably more licensing kind of stuff but um yeah. they're, they're they're coming out of a power play and you have some of these more traditional names uh you know get getting getting hit here Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is another example, too, of that. You know, a lot of people quote O'Neill and say, well, you know, in his book, he says 67 percent or so of, of uh, moves come from a group move. Yes, but not always. Um, and, and sometimes that that group move can start off with some leading stocks. And the, and then, as I pointed out before, then it broadens out to, to the group. So you don't mm -hmm. want to wait too long and just make, you know, and see the whole group moving. Sometimes you've got a rogue stock and that's the name that's benefiting. Sometimes from other stocks that are failing in the group, you get someone who's benefiting in that group. Yeah, uh, I'm not saying that that's ranked. necessarily the scenario here, but j just keep that, you know, in mind. Yeah, yeah. And the group is ranked 128, right? So that, I think that's a great example. Exactly. Or they could be doing something different. And I always think of Charles Schwab, you know, to your point, when Schwab in 98, when it came out, they were the online, you know, they had gone online. They were very uh, cutting edge in that regard. And so you looked at Charles Schwab at that time and you looked at all the other brokerage stocks. Charles Schwab looked like AOL. It didn't look yeah. like all the other brokerage stocks. That's the group it was in. But it was an online play, so it looked very different. So and that was the mistake I made early on was I would wait, you know, for the for all these things to line up on a macro level, and then I was missing the best stocks. Mm -hmm. But bot bottoms up is what I found. Even if you're applying, you know, a can slim uh, type strategy, you still want to go buy it bottoms up and look stock by stock. Yeah. One more thing on Jacks. Uh, so th this trades on average 138,000 shares a day. It's yeah. a 33 dollar stock. Um, can you get into this with size? Uh, does it have a liquidity issue? Well, to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why this particular stock we put out to our members and put it as a uh, uh, as a uh, potential uh, trade for them. But I did not buy it for myself mm -hmm. because it, it it did lack the volume, and I just couldn't wasn't going to be able to put it on enough size that I would have been comfortable with. Right. Yeah. yeah. So um, and and I just what I do is uh, to your point is I position size to the volume. So, and usually with, with a power play like this, I'll even buy a thousand shares or a couple thousand shares or 5,000 shares, and I won't take a big position, but I'll at least get some of it because I'd rather have a small position in a big moving stock than a big position in the stock that doesn't do anything. So, but position size, a good rule of thumb is, you know, 10% of the daily volume is, 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 is a good rule of thumb with the sort of the maximum that you'll, you'll, you'll go in for liquidity concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, shifting over to insurance, this was definitely one of the areas that had a lot mm -hmm. of strength. Uh, Brown and Brown was in there, uh, BRO. Uh, is the insurance play done, you know, or is this again just getting started? You usually think of insurance as being a little bit slower <clears throat> moving, but some of these stocks were definitely outperforming and had great relative strength. Yeah, these were a little bit more difficult on the fundamental side to evaluate like a growth stock. There's some other metrics that uh, are, are a little bit uh, uh, trickier. Uh, so the chart's good. It, it is acting more though, like the index, you know, it, it seems more like an index uh, play. Um, what I'll do sometimes is I'll buy some of the stocks that are more market type names, simply because if the market moves up, it goes up 10%, stocks will go up sometimes 15, 20, 30, you'll get leverage. 
Um, so even though it might track the index, I'd rather be into the individual stocks that track the index than the index itself, because usually you get some leverage out of the stocks. That would be this would be sort of more of that conservative play. But this is to me, it's more of a laggard with an 86 relative strength. This is more of a laggard. Mm -hmm. um, a real quick look uh, just in WWD. This is another area of interest, aerospace defense. Uh, this is definitely a group that's been very strong. Um, nice. a, a lot of a lot of stocks kind of setting up in this area. Uh, and we just had the Israel Hamas uh, blow up happen in October. So is this something that's getting more of your attention because of that or just because yeah. of the technical action? Well, this has got some of our capital. So this is one that we, we've, we, we've put on as an open position. Uh, strong earnings uh the group is strong I, I am a little concerned that i am getting into that laggard sort of getting late to the party into some of the names that are are not the leaders and this one is one of those it's a 90 relative strength you got other stocks in the group much higher relative strength but you know, if the if the group stays strong you know you'll probably it'll lift all boats here so but yeah it, it's it's all of the above what you said it's the, the earnings are, are strong uh, the sales are strong there's there's a there's a catalyst behind it certainly that whole aerospace group has been doing good and it's do and, and it's also uh if you notice too it's good in the smaller names as opposed to the the, the traditional uh uh general dynamics and uh, Lockheed. Lockheed right exactly yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. um over into retail and apparel um I mean some of these some of these have been removing a lot a and f uh comes to mind I do have a position in this myself Abercrombie and Fitch um I mean, this is certainly well extended, but what was the what was the buy here to you? And at what point do you start selling into strength? <clears throat> I think at this point, you know, if it runs up much from here, and I, I think for most stocks right now, if they're extended and they run up from here if, uh, on a swing basis, this is where I'd start nailing profits down on a shorter term basis. Uh, Abercrombie is clearly the leader all, all the way. It's been really just uh, performing fantastically with very little volatility, tons and tons of alpha. This is where you get a very high relative strength, high alpha, low standard deviation. This is precisely what I look for and the type of stock you, I want to hold longer when you get this type of action. Um, I bought this way early and even even prior before it set up here um, and it did not hold it long enough in all honesty, but uh, you know, huge earnings, um, you know, just uh, clearly the leader in the group, but you have that group, you've got uh, a GIII, uh, which um, we actually just sold and it, it went a, a bit higher here on earnings when it gapped in the morning, I sold it right on the gap and then it looked like it was a good sale. You had that yeah, big yeah. outside day and then it ended up uh, closing just a little bit off the lows and, and moving up a bit more here. So it's just showing that this group is, you know, is definitely uh, really strong. Even after they get extended, you have earnings, you know, they're moving even higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PVH is in there. Um, yeah. you know, Lulu, Lulu just had a big move on earnings, but right. it's extended also. You had a yeah. big outside day. Um, again, stocks, short term, they're extended, but, uh, yeah. but retail is definitely uh, making a comeback here. Mm -hmm. these, um, are, how about, these are turnaround situations. No, these, are, right. these are essentially turnaround situations. Um, how about over in tech? Because uh, certainly uh, computer software enterprise still seems to be strong. And you've got like mm -hmm. something like Cloudflare just coming out um, of a little a little contraction here after having a nice move up. Um, is this something that's on your radar? Yeah. Yeah. So fundamentally, uh, <clears throat> Net, Cloudflare, um, AMD, mm -hmm. uh, uh, CRW, uh, CRWD, these would be names that I would be thinking of as far as looking for opportunities um, from a fundamental basis, they've got some good things going on there. Uh, trying to make a case, sort of gravitate away from maybe some of the real mega caps that are starting to turn into yeah. the, in, the index. You know, I must well just buy the Qs, mm -hmm. you know, buy FNGS, you know, you're, you're getting the NASDAQ. So um, with such weighting now, so to get away from that sort of, um, you know, overweighting and market cap, you know, go to some names like this, which is still going to probably pretty much, you know, move with the market, but uh, you might get that leverage. And certainly you've got some, some good fundamentals in those names. Yeah. Well, I think uh, this gives our listeners plenty to consider. Uh, again, not, not everything is actionable right now, but I think this kind of helps you kind of gauge where some of these uh, positions could have been put on. And again, that selling into strength, how important that can be for short-term trading uh, to kind of rotate that money into the next next trade and be ready for those setups as they come in. So, hey, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge with us, Mark. Yeah. As always, it was a pleasure having you. 
Okay, great. I'm just going to give one last point. You know. Oh yeah, please. So the general rule of thumb is is that if you're shorter term trading, you really want to sell into strength. And the reason why is, let's just say, you know, your average profit is eight, ten, twelve percent, even fifteen percent. If you wait for it to come back down, get the low moving average or give backs you're going to give back, you know, just a 5% move. If you're up 10%, you get back half of your profit. So the shorter term trading you are, here's the general rule of thumb is the shorter your trading is in as far as duration, the more you want to be selling right into that strength and not using uh, negative or downside sell rules. Now, if you, for longer term, then it's just the opposite. You want to use the downside sell rules because you have to let the stock correct and pull back and go through pullbacks to be able to make a bigger move. And that's where you want to give them some room and uh, a leading stock that breaks out of initial first or second stage base in a new bull market. Some of these can go an amazing distance, go 500, a thousand percent and never close below the 50 day moving average. So you can use that type of uh, backstop on a moving average. But again, the, the, those are, that's sort of the general rule of thumb that I follow. Yeah. Good words of wisdom to end on, and uh, I'm sure that's going to help a lot of people with their own trading. And uh, again, the compounding can really work out to be some phenomenal gains, as you've proven time and time again in your own account and in the U.S. Investing Champion. So uh, remember, if you uh, want to follow Mark on X, formerly known as Twitter, that's at Mark Minervini. And uh, what about um, if they want to kind of join your Minervini private access, what's the best uh, way to get get involved with what you're doing on a daily basis? You just go to minervini.com. Yeah, simple as that. So thanks again for being here, Mark. Really appreciate it. Hey, great for great. Thanks for having me. Great being here. And you guys take care and happy trading. Okay. Uh, and that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Uh, please join us next week. We're going to have Randy Watts from O'Neill Global Advisors, uh, someone that Arusha knows uh, very well, works with on a daily basis. I haven't seen Randy very uh, very much in the last few years, uh, of course, but uh, it'll be good to catch up with him. Uh, he's a senior portfolio manager there and a uh, lot of great information that he's able to share. He's also a contributor, uh, isn't he, uh, to uh, Arusha? Yeah, cut me out on for, this. For a number of things. Yeah, for, for, yeah. for a number of things. Yeah, yeah a, a number of publications that he, he contributes uh, some really great articles to. So it's going to be great to get his thoughts on the market. So hope you join us for that. Thanks a lot for watching us this week. We'll see you.